Welcome to the 76 Capital Leadership Series. My name is Wayne Kimmel and I'm your host and also managing partner of 76 Capital. And as you know, on this show, I interview top sports entrepreneurs, athletes, executives who are truly shaping and many times changing the overall sports business industry. Now, I want to do a quick shout out to our producer back at the station, back in Philly, James Santor, always does a great job. Follow James at James Santor on Twitter, and you can follow me at Wayne Kimmel on Twitter and across all the social media networks, as well as 76 Capital. And you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to do the next, next thing in the sports industry, sports betting, esports, the sports tech world, sports media, reach out to us at 76 Capital. We'd love to talk to you. But let's get right to it. We have a great guest today. We have Andy Miller. He is the chairman and, and co-founder of NRG Esports. Um, I am just so excited to have you on, and he has so many other titles and has done so many other things. Um, you know, Andy, welcome to our 76 Capital Leadership Series. Thanks, thanks. Great to be here. Well, Andy, you know, I want to get into you as the chairman and co-owner of the of NRG Esports, but first, one of the things that we do on our 76 Capital Leadership Series is really talk about and, and talk with our guests about their whole path to success and to where they are today. And, and we'd like to go all the way back. So I'd like to you know, take you back where you were born, where'd you go to school? Sure. And uh, you know, were you into sports back then? And kind of what, was, what were you kind of into at that point? Yeah, yeah, for sure. My bumpy path, uh, definitely non-traditional. So uh, born in Boston, raised outside of Boston. So lived in Boston forever until about 10 years ago, moved out here to California. But um, yeah, so when you're born in Boston, as you know, and being in Philly, not much different. It's hard not to be a sports fan. So, and you can't just be a sports fan of one team. You have to be a sports fan of all teams. So that was pretty much the case with me, uh, although I over-indexed on Red Sox uh, and Celtics for a long time. But uh, so I grew up and wanted to get involved in sports. The sports editor of my high school paper, uh, played sports, a lot of baseball, loved it, and um, went to college at Union College, which is in Schenectady, New York, uh, near Albany. So a small school, one of the oldest schools in the country. Actually, smallest school to ever win the Division One National Championship, I believe, which would be in hockey. Wow. Uh, bunch of years pack. Uh, got that little puck there as a souvenir. But uh, I was sports editor of my paper there as well. So it was all sports. Wanted to maybe go and be a sports writer. I really enjoyed the writing and the journalism aspect of things and sat down with my dad, who was a business guy, who said, well, how are you going to pay for anything? <laughs> you know, wh what are you going to do? You're going to cover, uh, you know, JV baseball in uh, Oklahoma or something for a while. Is that really what you want to do? And I was like, I don't know, maybe. So I started to name a few things. He said, what else would you like to do? Do you want to get into? Uh, I said, you know, advertising. I like advertising seems interesting. And he said, well, your sisters are in advertising and I pay for their apartment in New York City. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh, he's like, why don't you go to law school? So I did, uh, which wasn't a mistake, but uh, I actually really liked it. It was Boston College Law School. I went back to Boston and um, I took a bunch of classes and sports law and other things like that, trying to sort of keep that going, but ended up doing relatively surprisingly well. You know, in law school, it's all about that first year. Your, your, your grades there determine your, your next uh, two years in your job. So shockingly did well and um, had a whole bunch of firms who wanted to, me to work there. So being the, you know, oh, by the way, I, I, I didn't graduate like a, a skipping grades, but I was young, like men, emotionally, maturity wise, which is why I'm probably now in a game with a bunch of 18 year old boys all day long. Uh, but also age wise, like, you know, I graduated college, barely 21, and I went right to law school. And um, I, so I picked the firm that represented the Red Sox, of course, because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> literally no legal ambitions at all, just trying to figure out the sports angle. And I got to do a little bit of Red Sox work during the summer, and then they offered a job, and I was like, this is great. And I get there, I'm like, let's do some, what do I get to do for the Sox? And they were like, nothing, you're, you're a 1L, you know, you, you'll maybe, you know, in six, seven years, you'll get to work on the account like everybody else here. And I was like, uh, okay. And they put me in, um, you'll love this one, about as far away from sports as you can be. I did a bunch of work for maritime law. So ships, not boats, you got to call them ships. 
and uh that sucked i hated it and i was terrible at it and it didn't work and after not that long period of time they were like i don't think this is for you and i said i don't think this is for me either and i really had the entrepreneurial bug um especially that was like you know internet 1.0 and um well andy andy before you get to that before yeah. you get to your, your your what you did after practicing a little bit um or, or very, little. <laughs> very little very little <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, going going back to your your childhood, and you talked about you know that you're being such a fan and a, a Boston fan, and Red Sox, Celtics fan. Were there any specific players or coaches or even the ownership at the time that you kind of looked up to or really, you know, you, you were like, wow, someday. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll... Let's see. So, yeah. it's a benefit of being in the office. So. Here's an old school Red Sox picture from like 78, 77 Red Sox outfield of Yaz, Lynn, and Rice. I was, uh, yeah, Yaz, Lynn, and Rice. And everyone loved Yaz, of course. And I was like, wow, like you could, you know, you just had to be part of, of Yaz and part of Boston. But Lynn and Rice came up and they were the gold dust twins and they were the big stars and i'm young at this point right this is the world series just at, and this is a couple years after 75 world series uh you know heartbreak but for me it was so it was such a moment that i remember because i was like uh seven eight nine and i was able to for the first time talk to my uncles and my father and older people about sports and I just started to suck in everything I could about, you know, reading the newspaper and these articles and watching watching um, a sportscaster who I loved in Boston on local TV, Bob Lobel. And I was like, wow, I can talk to everybody now. And I loved it. Right. I wasn't a kid anymore because I was always the youngest in everything. I was like, this is great. And it was such a great connection, you know, for sports and especially in Boston. Right. And and, and, and to be part of you know society and, and my family. So I never forgot. And those guys were you know, that was probably you know, my first love there. Those those teams. Amazing. Amazing. We're here with Andy Miller, the chairman and co-owner of NRG Sports. He's also an owner, a co-owner of the Sacramento Kings of the NBA and a number of other teams that we're going to talk about as well on our on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And Andy, you know, also growing up in Boston, you probably um, you know, went to a, a number of games at the Boston Garden, the original Boston Garden. What, what was what was it like going there? And, and <laughs> it was sweaty. <laughs> it was sweaty. I remember my first game, my dad took me, we sat pretty high up and um, we weren't in the top, top, but we were in the next level, right? And they, if you remember, they had an overhang and it was um, uh, like girders. And I remember sitting there and I was like this and my dad's like, what do you look, the game's down here, what are you looking at? And I'm like, look at those rats right there. <laughs> and they're all these rats, they were so close to us. It was like, didn't seem to bother anybody. I guess they were just used to it. But uh, I just loved I loved the sea of humanity of going to the old garden. Uh, but Fenway Park's definitely my happy place. We um, I was actually telling the story to my kids. I remember my one of my first I begged my dad to take me to a Red Sox Yankee game, and he finally got tickets. It was really hot, and we were in the right field pavilion. Um, and that, those are the seats if you're familiar with Fenway, where you kind of face the field like you'll face the left fielder but home plate's way over there you know so you have to watch the whole game like this through a couple columns and it was under way under the underhang but you could smoke back then and it was brutal because it was probably a hundred degrees and a hundred percent humidity and i was like <laughs> it was terrible i was like my dad's like let's go for a walk you know we walked around the park for like the whole game but um i love fenway i had season tickets before i moved for like 20 years it's the greatest well, your story of the rafters in, at the garden um, actually reminds me of a story when I was when I was at University of Maryland and, and I used to broadcast the, the Maryland basketball games. And we, we went we broadcast a Maryland Boston University game at the garden. And of course, they put us way up in the rafters. There was no one there, but they yeah. put us way up in the rafters to uh, in the press box up there. And we got to see some interesting things. up there. <laughs> there was a home field advantage in there. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, all the dead spots on the floor, et cetera. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, amazing. You know, so so Andy, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, you know, so you talked about after um, going to law school at at, at Boston University, uh, at uh, Boston College, excuse me. Um, you're at Boston College, and then you said the kind of the internet bug caught you. 
What, 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 what? Yes. Yes. So, Internet 1.0 was starting and I was reading all these books and um, I had a friend. There was a book called The uh, Nudist on the Night Shift. And, I, and it was about, I was so out here in Silicon Valley, how this guy was a nudist, but he was such a good uh, coder that they let him come in, you know, and do his thing in his, in his, in his space from like, you know, 12 a.m. to 6 a.m. And I was like fascinated, like, wow, like that, this is, this is definitely a gold rush. And uh, I had a friend at MIT at the Media Lab who asked me to help him with a business plan, like, you know, you're a lawyer. I was like, yeah, okay, for like, you know, an hour. Uh, but I really got into it and um, started hanging around the famous MIT Media Lab during those days at, you know, Internet 1.0, that was the place to be for sure. And uh, met a professor and a student um, in, involved with video. And we ended up starting a company together. And um, I negotiated the license with the MIT uh, uh, technology license office. And we licensed the kids senior thesis and got started. And it was like my first startup. It was amazing. And I loved it. And I was like, wow, this is totally what I want to do. And we took us, we should have known it was probably not the greatest company because it took us a while to raise money in like the market, in a market where you could, you know, meet a guy at the deli and you walked out with a million dollars, you know, everybody was looking for a startup. Uh, but it was such an MBA for me because we, we raised money. I remember literally like going to Kinko's and binding business plans and mailing them off to Sand Hill Road, California. I was like waiting to hear back from, a, you know, like we, it was it was incredible. And um, and then when we finally got funded, uh, getting employees was unbelievably hard, especially in Boston. And we would literally we went to the deli and uh, put up, you know, little posters in there and all over the, the, the MIT area to, to get going. Uh, but it was such a great MBA in learning, you know, uh, the startup business. And, and ever since then, I was completely, completely, you know, smitten. Well, that was your first startup. And so tell us, you know, the the rest of your sort of your path within the within the tech world. I know that, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, what, what happened next? So, you know, I'm not a tech guy per se. Like I know enough to be dangerous and it, uh, uh, I'm only about, you know, my product in my companies. Like, I, I think I would have the respect of the engineers because I could kind of call bullshit on them, but that was about as far as I could go. <laughs> so I was, they were willing to listen a little bit, but um, that company, we ended up selling to another startup uh, that moved out to Los Angeles. And that, um, I had stayed on for a bit and we uh, went to, I went to London and uh, with my wife and very young son, oldest son now, and started up like the European office for them, let's say. But while we were out there, I was just blown away by everybody with their phones, everybody with, you know, taking pictures, uh, go to the dinner. This wasn't happening in the United States then. Everybody would go, they'd sit down, young adults, and then they'd be on their phones just like they are now. They Or they'd take a billion pictures and, you know, there was some apps that were starting to develop, not really apps, but uh, sites. And I was like, wow. And text messaging nonstop. We didn't have text messaging. Uh, we didn't have interoperability, meaning like if you were on Sprint and I was on Verizon back then, we couldn't be friends because we couldn't text each other. So um, a, another friend of mine through college, star, Jeff Glass, who I think you've met, uh, who's a great entrepreneur, uh, had a company called MCube, which is the worst name ever for any company, let alone a startup. You know, so for those of you out there, you're looking to uh, start your name, your first company, here's a, a, what not to do. So it was uh, lowercase m hyphen, capital Q, U-B-E, because uh, it was supposed to be a mobile marketing messaging company, 3M cubed, and they were struggling a bit, and Jeff uh, said, hey, you know, you're creative, can you help me with a business idea? Uh, and I said, well, I don't really like your model. He's like, I don't either. He said, just come work with me, we'll figure it out. And he sent me to CTIA, which was the big cellular telephone internet thing out in Vegas. And it was early days there. And I was just transformed like I was when I first, you know, started following sports and talking to people because it was so early days that I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I could see where this was going to go, especially on the text messaging side. 
And that's what Jeff's business was doing. So they were doing you know, free messaging for people. Uh, so I came back. I said, we should not do free messaging for, you know, Starbucks. People don't want a coupon popping up on their phone when they walk by a Starbucks, which was kind of the model. We should run everybody's traffic because everybody's going to want to text with each other and interoperability between carriers. And we should run premium messaging. And that's what we did. And we exploded. Uh, it was just the greatest, most, you know, if I had any hair at the time, it would have been gone because it was the most meteoric rise we did. I think like the first year uh, they did zero revenue. And then the next year I came, we did 5 million, but all of it in December. And then the next year we did 85, 86 million. Um, and we had everybody from Major League Baseball to CNN to ringtones and horoscopes. And we were running all this stuff. And But what we did was we interconnected all the carriers so that everybody could text everybody. And uh, it was a great business. And it got bought by... Um, I won't say it was a great business because it had a lot of a lot of issues, but it was a, it was an interesting business, and it got bought by uh, Verisign, and I was there for like two months, and I was said, you know, this is this I don't like anything about this. This was a group of clowns that I didn't want to be a part of. No offense, but I was like, yeah, you can take offense, but I was just I want to do this again. So I started Quattro Wireless, which is was the mobile ad network that uh, again out of Boston that ended up being a big success, thank God, and we sold to Apple, and that's how I ended up uh, moving out here and working for Steve Jobs. Wait, so you <laughs> said that off. so quickly, but that's one of the uh, things I really I want I want to talk about, but you know, before mm -hmm. we get get to the to the esports side of of sure. your world, so you sold and that and that company was Quattro Wireless. Quattro yeah. Wireless, yeah, it was a mobile ad network, and uh, it was. Now you could say, okay, mobile ad network, but back then there were barely any wired ad networks that were working. And um, another great sort of beginner's mind, uh, a term that Steve Jobs used all the time, like I didn't know shit about advertising. Or I didn't even know what a CPM was, but I knew that people weren't going to continue to pay for content on their phone, having that experience at MCube where it was like $9.99 for baseball alerts. I was like, people aren't gonna pay for that. It needs to be ad supported. And so started to, you know, that was the premise behind creating this network. Uh, and we had a really interesting model that catapulted us um, in the beginning days where everybody wanted to have CNN or Univision or you name it as their, um, and their ad network, right, as their publisher. But these guys didn't even have mobile websites at the time. I mean, remember that day, like you'd get on your phone and it would be the, you'd have to like keep scrolling over because it was the wired website and didn't didn't fit. And so we came up with some technology to do that pretty easily. And I went to everybody and I said, here's the deal. Uh, you give me, I'll, I'll build you a site for free. Just let me run the ads and I'll give you a piece of it. And 99 times out of 100, they said, you can keep all the money because it's not going to be anything. Just make sure this works. Right. I was like, great. And so eventually they took it over and whatever. But because I had all these blue chip publishers, I was able to get these blue chip advertisers, Procter and Gamble and uh, Johnson and Johnson and others. And everybody else was had like, you know, dentists and Scottsdale ads. So Steve Jobs noticed it and um, he had just come back from one of his health issues and it was like the first thing he did. And I got this random call, like back to this, you know, everything goes back to sports. I was in um, London with my two co-founders, all of us big Patriots fans. And we went to see like one of those first Wembley games, you know, like the NFL teams in London, which was a novelty at the time. And it was the Patriots. And um, we were walking out and my phone rang and I picked it up and it was a guy who's had a corp dev from Apple. And he said, um, hey, are you, you know, interested in you know, selling your company? We're interested in buying, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, come on, is this real? Like for, for a minute, a lot of, there's, there's, there's a couple of stories in there about kind of hanging up on you know, Steve Jobs. But uh, I, th those, uh, my friends kept walking, my, my co-founders. And so I had to find them like later when uh, you know, they were at a pub. And they're like, what, what, what happened to you? I'm like, uh, we're going home. They're like, what do you mean? I was like, we, we got to, we have to be in Cupertino in like a week. We have to prepare. And because uh, he actually wanted me to be there tomorrow, the next day. And I was like, one, we're in London, but two, I knew we were, didn't have our act together at all. So um, it took, I sat down with, with Ishwar and Lars, and I, I'm no exaggeration, it was probably 45 minutes to an hour before they actually believed that I just got a call from Apple, that they're interested in buy recovery, uh, and that we needed to go home. So uh, that uh, it was craziness from that point on life became a whirlwind 
that's an amazing story. I mean, I'm sure that, um, you know, there's there's a, a lot, lots of details. We could do a whole show on that. But, you know, just quickly, so you then so ended up selling the company to yeah. Apple. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as, as you've shared with me in the past, you, you were working, you know, directly with Steve Jobs. What was that like? It's terrifying. <laughs> um, amazing, exhilarating. It was not, not a lot of fun, but it was, I mean, the greatest experience. So, um I moved out here, uh, I had two little kids and we bought the company, sold the company like December. So I, I moved out in January. I commuted starting December, January uh, for, you know, six months, eight months until August till school was over and we found a house. So that was really hard. Like, you know, if anyone's ever done that, but across country Monday to Friday, it was really hard. It was just complete. I don't remember a lot. It was exhausting. But when I was here, it was all Apple all day, you know, 18, 20 hours a day. They didn't have they didn't buy companies back then. And if they did, they never, you know, integrated anything. Like we were one of the biggest companies they had bought. I think we had 120 people. So I didn't have an op. I was in like a lockdown room on a picnic bench for many months in the iPad development place, which was cool because I got to see the you know iPad getting made and, and shipped out the door, but or, or released. But um it was hard. So Steve was just what you expect, like brilliant, you know, five tool athlete, he could do everything. Um, but super demanding, didn't suffer fools. You were a bozo in a meeting. You just had to leave a meeting not being a bozo because you had this bozo hero roller coaster everyone talks about, which was very true. Like you could be a bozo and a hero in the same meeting, but as long as you ended up on the you know the good side of of, of that, uh, it was an okay meeting. Uh, very challenging and unbelievably stressful. <laughs> really stressful. So, how many years were you there uh, at Apple? I was only there two, a little less than two. He, he passed away, and um, and then I moved on to. Uh, I tried to be a VC for a little bit and didn't like it. No, no offense to to you guys there in the VC world. Just was a little more of a builder, and uh, that's when I really got into sports at that time. So being a Boston kid, bought my company. I had you know a bunch of money for the first time, and I was like, I want to get involved in sports, but that was never going to happen at Apple. I mean, I, I didn't even have time to your kids in at night so that was not happening but when i left i bought into um a minor league baseball team <clears throat> called the modesto nuts which is the high single a team for the rockies at the time which we sold to seattle but that was so much fun i loved it <clears throat> um i bought it um when i was still in boston so i'd never seen any of it and I was told it wasn't very far from Palo Alto, which was maybe by as the as the crow flies, but not uh, by a car. <laughs> so it'd be like you know, eight hundred different roads to get to uh, uh, over in the bay there uh, on the East Bay. But uh, I loved it, and uh, I learned so much about it. And then I wanted to try and put a group together to buy the A's. So I started talking to a bunch of people, um, and including uh, Chris Lahane, who's one of our dear friends, going way back to college. Chris. Some of your listeners would probably know he's a pretty famous guy. Uh, now he's like the uh, head of policy or something at Airbnb, but he's famous for being Gore's press secretary, the hanging Chad, right hand guy, out in the pit bull, out in front on everything. Had a PR firm after that, a very famous one, crisis PR firm, represented everybody from Kobe to you name it. And uh, he's brilliant. And he was sort of the right hand guy advisor to Mayor Kevin Johnson of Sacramento at the time. And so he called me up and said, hey, did you know that uh, Steve Ballmer bought the Kings technically and he's trying getting approval from the NBA to move the Kings to Seattle? And we're looking for a group and you have a group. I know it's for the A's. Are you guys interested in um, in the NBA? And there had been lots of other talks in and around with other groups. And we were like, yeah. And Mark Masteroff, who I know you know, founder of 24 Hour Fitness, my business partner on, on energy, said, I, you know, he's, he's a basketball guy. And he's like, yeah, let's do that. And so a bunch of groups got together. And uh, eventually, after much uh, well-documented uh, a back and forth and heartache and, and, and many votes, the NBA rightfully kept the Kings in Sacramento. We built, we got the team, built a new stadium. Amazing, amazing story. And so, what has that been like for you? You know, as, as a as an NBA owner or a, a co-owner of, of of that team, and you know the sort of the ups and downs of the NBA seasons. You know, bringing you know having 
coaching changes and GM changes and just all the things that you guys have, have gone through over the years. Yeah. Um, well, it's been great. Sacramento is unbelievable. I know people kind of hear about it, but until you go there, you don't really understand how beloved the Kings are in Sacramento. It's the, it's the Packers in, in Green Bay. You know, it's the one team town but they bleed purple. And even if you don't like basketball, you're very proud of the Kings, hopefully. And um, when the Kings are not, I wouldn't even say playing well, that doesn't matter as much, but if they're not reflecting the values of Sacramento, if it's something you, they can't be proud of the owners. Like there was a, a time where the Maloofs were the greatest owners in sports. And there was a time where they were considered the worst. And that was embarrassing to Sacramento. And it was, you know, it's tough for the, for the city's psyche. It's a very diverse city, and they support support the team through everything. So um, I think we've been a bit of a bit of both. Also, you know, we've gone through a whole bunch of changes and put some dreadful teams out there. I think this year is probably our best team ever that we've had. Um, I don't know if the record will be such, but with the young kids we have and the way they're playing is is incredibly hopeful. So I think there's um, you know a lot to be said for Sacramento basketball. But um, it's fun, like going to the games and doing everything is fun. I used to get involved with the draft. I do very little now compared to what I did. Everything is kind of now energy for me. But um, the NBA is just a great. I think it's a good investment, and it's a, it's it's the, probably the best run league in my opinion. I mean, it's really it's it's a special group that you have have up there in Sacramento as well. I mean, it's it was kind of one of the first you know, kind of tech only entrepreneurs who went out and, and, and bought an NBA team um, as, as a group, right? I mean, and, and, and a lot of people look at, you know, you and Vivek and the rest of the, the rest of the ownership as kind of forward thinking. Are there certain things that you as a, as, as a tech uh, entrepreneur and leader and, and, and the, rest of the, t- the rest of the owners there, are there things that you guys went in and started doing things differently? Or are there ways that you look at the business differently because of your background and because of how, you know, analytic and, and, and tech savvy that you are as, 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 as owners of the team? Well, I don't know. Um, I think we talk a good game on the, on the, on the basketball operations side, but the results haven't been there. So I don't think that's something that we, uh, you know, can say that we're, we're excelling at, but I can tell you from the tech standpoint and just the way we approach building the stadium was, um, you know, unbelievable. I don't know if you've ever been up there, but it's, it's gorgeous and it is so smart the way that it's, it's every bit of it, the way that, um, it's sunken in the bowl. It's the first indoor outdoor stadium. We have these giant, like, Tesla rocket airplane hangers, uh, doors that go up. Uh, so you feel the breeze, the way uh, you can control the air flow um, because of the natural sort of Delta air breeze in Sacramento area. Um, you know, Sacramento can get hot, but it never gets hot there in, uh, in the stadium, uh, even without air conditioning. And just the design is super smart for both um, basketball and music. And we created a whole, we spent a bunch of extra money, went way over budget because we wanted to put the practice facility attached to uh, the stadium and the medical facilities attached and everything kind of all fit together in a real, real smart way. That's, that's awesome. Well, we're really excited to have you, Andy, on our 76 Capital Leadership Series. And we've talked about all the things that you've done but the, the piece we really want to talk about is what you're doing now as the chairman and co-owner of NRG Esports. And, um, you know, how did you go from kind of the traditional sports world to the world of esports in, and, and, and built one of the top esports teams, not only in the country, but in the world? Yeah. So I'm really, I mean, I, I am all the things as far as like founder and whatever, but I'm the CEO. So I've been at it from day one in the muck and it's definitely muck in that I think we got into it. And a lot of people got into it thinking, Oh, this is sports, right? This is just like traditional sports. And, um, there's so many parallels, but it's not. So there's a lot to figure out here. Uh, we got into it in that vein, me, Mark Masteroff, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq is actually a corner of the Kings as well. And we just loved it. And Shaq had been just a, famous video of Shaq getting roasted by a, a, a caster from an esports uh, uh, game uh, tournament that he happened to stumble upon. And um, he loved it. He lo- he's a giant gamer too. And Mark's kids are all big gamers. 
uh, and big athletes. And my kids are uh, not big athletes, but big gamers. So we all sort of started watching. And I started looking back in the day at the numbers for viewership on Twitch. And I mean, most people didn't even know what Twitch was back then. And my, my kids were watching it. So I looked and I was like, what is this? What is this 36, 39,000 here? And they're like, oh, that's the concurrent viewers. I'm like, wait, 39,000 people are watching this kid play whatever the game is all day because he streams for eight hours. I said, yeah. I said, well, that's an entire week or more probably of viewership for the Kings or anyone, well, almost any any NBA team, you know, if you add up the, the uniques, right, for our television audience. I think like, this is really fascinating. And of course, it's all it's a great cohort that is you know, cord cutters and, and ad blockers if you want to reach. So we got into it um, with one team, made every mistake you could probably make, didn't realize exactly how unbelievably competitive and analytical it was and got smoked on, on, on a lot of levels, uh, redoubled down. And over the last couple of years, we've been on fire. We've won in most everything we've been in, world championships and back-to-back -back and Overwatch League, Rocket League, uh, Fortnite, we dominate uh, a whole bunch of games. And um, what we've learned is there are a lot of parallels to esports from the competitive aspect of it, uh, events. You know, you can't fill a stadium yet 40, 50 times a year like you can for a basketball team. But for a few times a year, you can put it, you can fill 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people. Uh, I, we, my, my team won the Overwatch League in Philadelphia uh, two years ago, and I was standing, you know, on, it was at Wells Fargo Stadium on the on the stage there, and we were on ESPN, ABC TV, and I'm holding a trophy, and I'm looking out over, I don't know, 15,000 people, and for, uh, I felt like Robert Kraft for a second, and another second, I was terrified. <laughs> I was like, they're like, you know, what do you have to say? I was like, uh, yeah, this is great, let's do it again, but, um, like, that's sports, right? And we grew energy, which is pronounced energy, like E N E R G Y. Give me your energy, but it is uh, written out N R G. So a lot of people, including Shaq, which drives me nuts, always says Team N R G. But um, we'll take it. Uh, we're we're known worldwide because we have great um, teams, but we have great content, and that's sort of where we started to really dive in over the last eighteen months. Uh, and creating lots of short form content and taking advantage of all these platforms from YouTube, YouTube Shorts, TikTok, Instagram Stories, Reels, the whole world of uh, these sort of, um, you know, short attention span theater, if you will, for gaming. And we've grown massively, massively. The all and people know our guys all over the world, and it's all been a virtual circle. They've gotten bigger, their streams have gotten bigger, our audience has gotten bigger. Uh, we just announced uh, a, a, our biggest sponsorship ever, which is with Hot Pockets. Uh, great fit, right? But what we did, which I think is really smart, I'm really proud of, is that we didn't build a facility for our guys to train in like other teams. We have facilities; it's great. And people always tout them and they do these great tours. Look at us. And we've got massage pods and these great, you know, training rooms. And the fans are like, ooh, I want to be there someday. But that's it. They never hear from it again and they don't care. We went the other way and we took out a 20,000 square foot uh, warehouse in downtown L.A. And we made um, basically Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for gaming. It, if you go to our YouTube at Energy Esports and you can check out the video, it's insane. It's colorful and gorgeous and we had set designers from famous uh studios in la build us craziness like somebody gave us an exact replica of the oval office and, and with the desk the whole deal and we do videos state of the unions in there and it's called the rage room and everything is basically petrified so you can take a bat and beat the crap out of like your keyboard after the game and we have we just did a video in there yesterday which did really well uh we have uh, a giant two level slide where you can a couch where you can play matches against the guy below you. We've got the chairs from like the view, not the view, the, uh, the voice where you hit the button and turn around It's big game show stuff. And we film stuff in there all day long. Like that's the type of stuff that gets chopped up, put on our YouTube, put on our TikTok, put on whatever. And then somehow, you know, people see it all over the world and yeah, I'm wearing my energy hat and traveling and you name it. And people are, Hey, energy on top, let's go. And so that's, that's a great feeling. And when you compare that to, let's say the Kings, my guess is, you know, in our last four or five years, we're probably three, four times the size of the Kings in fan base and audience. Now they have a different model and they're way bigger in revenue and everything else. You know, we can't put 
you know, 30,000 people in a stadium like they can 40 times or whatever at 19,000 people. But um, it's different. And I guess if that sort of explains kind of where the world is going with uh, electronic gaming. Well, it's pretty amazing to see what you've done in energy sports. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, you know, from a, from, from a team perspective to a team that is not only that wins, um, you know, as, and as champion, you know, as champion of the, of the different games, but also from a, from a social perspective. And, you know, so tell us, you know, you know, again, you, you mentioned Shaq is, is one of the owners with you, yeah, which yeah. must be a lot of fun. How did you, how did you bring him into this? Um, he is really close with Mark at Master of, and I had done some work with him as well. And he is part of the Kings. I mean, it's a little known fact, but he's a small giant man, small owner of the Kings. So we've all known each other for a while and he's the world's biggest kid. Like he's been in gaming. He's more authentic gamer than me or anybody. Like he's been at it from day one. He has his own games. He's whole house is set up for gaming. He loves it. And um, he's super competitive and he was all over it from day one. And then Mark and I started it and he found out uh, he was watching a match and he was talking to Mark I and mean, Mark's like, what are you watching? And he's like, oh, it's this team NRG versus somebody. And Mark's like, oh, that's my team. He's like, what do you, what do you mean? Like, oh, that's me and Andy. He's like, oh no, that's me and Andy and Mark. <laughs> I'm in. I was like, okay, so uh, who doesn't say no to Shaquille? So I uh, asked him if he wanted to do it and he uh, signed up. Um, and since Shaquille joined right away, we've had Alex Rodriguez uh, and Jennifer Lopez. Alex has been on our board. Um, Tiesto, who is the godfather of EDM, and he's amazing, and his you know shows in Vegas sell out and all over the world, and he's been actually very helpful in thinking about branding. Uh, we have you know a lot of Philly boys, Jimmy Rollins, and uh, your partner there as well um, at, at seventy six, um, uh, Ryan Howard, and. Whole bunch of folks so it's been uh, marshawn lynch who's super super fun i'm actually sitting here holding marshawn lynch's championship ring because i haven't been able to uh get it to him yet for uh when when we won uh the, the san francisco shock but uh because he's been a big fan of you know being from uh from oakland the bay area um uh, he's been a, a big supporter of the shock so it's been a great group super fun everybody brings something to the table yeah, absolutely incredible. I mean, it must be, you know, it must be different, you know, you know, so you own the Sacramento Kings is one of the owners there and it's just basketball with energy. You have multiple games, multiple players on the different teams underneath kind of the, the yeah, mothership. Yeah, yeah. I know a, a lot of people out and you'll get, I'm sure this has happened to you as well. I've, I've had people say to me, my, you know, moms or even dads, um, my kid plays league of legends. He's not an esports player. He doesn't play esports, and I'm like, no, no, no. Let me explain it to you. <laughs> I try to explain yeah. that you know it's part of all of this, right? Yeah. yeah. So how how does that all work? Where you have all the different teams, uh, people are experts at certain games, and the new new games come around like Valorant or other things that sort of yeah. just come yeah. out of nowhere. Like, how does that all work? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's it's a lot to put your arms around for sure. We used to have a lot more teams, and we've sort of skinnied down to what's important to us and the different communities, but you hit the nail on the head. They are all different communities. Like one of the big uh, assumptions that people make, you know, no one's going to come on your show and say, hey, uh, I like sports. Like, you know, just because I like sports doesn't mean that I like every sport, right? Like if I like gaming doesn't mean I'm a game, I don't like every game, you know, like if I, I like I happen to love baseball and basketball. I, I, I don't give me hockey content. I don't, I don't love it. Like I like it, but I don't love it. I'm not into it. Right. And that's like saying, um, you know, someone who plays overwatch probably despises Fortnite. You know, it's not like they're the same person just because they're a gamer. And once you realize that there are all these different communities and you start giving them the content that they want, you start giving them, uh, you know, the, the type of attention that they deserve as a specific community, not lump it all together. It starts to work. So, but, but you have to follow it all. You have to understand it all. There's every, every community has its own language, its own heroes, its own you know, memes, its own taboos. So that is challenging, especially on social media um, and also in scouting. But um, yeah, I mean, you don't have to love the sport to love the game. So, 
you know, I love horse racing. I think it's really interesting, but I don't follow the sport. I couldn't tell you who is, you know, important, but I think it's cool and beautiful. And it's the same with like my, my son downstairs loves uh, Call of Duty, but he doesn't follow the professional Call of Duty. So, um, but a lot of people do. So that's kind of the way it chops up. But what we've seen, if anything, from the pandemic, for sure, is everybody's a gamer. Everybody. I mean, one in three people on the planet game every day, whether it's a simple game on their phone or on their console or their PC around the world. And there's new games all the time. And it is such an exciting giant space that, uh, you know, it's bigger than movies, television, all that combined. It's a hard thing to ignore from a media perspective. Well, it, it's definitely huge across across everything that's happening right now. I mean, and, and the pandemic is certainly has has shined you know an incredible light um, on mm -hmm. on the esports industry. Um, when you think about the industry today and what you believe it will look like, say in you know three to five years, you know where do you think it w where it will be? I think it depends on where you are. So, I think if you're in Asia. South America, a lot of it looks like traditional sports where you'll fill stadiums and there'll be the national team of Vietnam will be a League of Legends team, not a soccer team, um, because these populations are so young and they're growing up playing these games and they don't care about some of these other sports and they don't have the NFL and the NBA and the NHL and 17 other properties to go look at and this will be their game and, and they will be proud and and they will want a, a team from vietnam to win worlds and esports will be the dominant games and in, in a lot of these regions in other places like europe and the united states where there's tons of other op, op, you know entertainment options from a gaming and uh, sports standpoint i think it'll be entertainment it'll be a lot more like wwe than the nba uh, with barnstorming events and leagues and content and uh, the content side will start to dominate because you've grown up playing games. You want to watch stuff about games and guys who play games and girls who play games. And that's what you want to do. So the professional part of it will be part of it. But I think the gaming culture will dominate here. You know, one of the things that we have at our 76 Capital at, on our, at our company is we have our athlete venture group where athletes get involved in the different companies we invest in. And what we found is so many of our athletes are so interested in the gaming world. They're all gamers, right? They're the same age as our players. So, you know, from, from you know, and are you, you're, you're seeing that because you have a bunch of them as owners. What about some of the, like, the guys who are on the Kings you guys like De'Aaron Fox, when he's a really big player, right? I mean, how does it how does it kind of go back and forth? Every single player in the NBA, I would say, I would bet you ninety something percent is a gamer, and they bring their their rigs with them and their headsets, and they play games nonstop to relax. And it's we had De'Aaron Fox on one of our our content pieces a little while ago. He's the greatest, and. Um, they're so competitive. We've had lots of guys. The best was uh, Trace McSorley. It was, he's hilarious. But um, they 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 love our guys. Like we get calls all the time. Hey, I won't say. Can, can I play Rocket League with the Energy Rocket League team? Or I'm a Fortnite guy and I'm obsessed with clicks. Uh, you know, and, and um, they're the same age practically, right? Especially the 18, 19, 20, 21 year old. Halliburton on the uh, hopefully rookie of the year on the Kings is just 21 years old. Like, so is, so is our guys. And um, it's very interesting seeing that crossover. So they get it. They understand how good these guys are uh, on, on our end. They understand how hard it is to perform on a live stage. So that when they think about investments or something after their career, they kind of see the parallels there. And what you're also seeing, especially with the younger folks, and I would say the NBA does it the best. NFL, great as well. You know, they all have their own brands, right? Like Russell Wilson has his own social media person making memes and making him do all this stuff because uh, he wants to. And it's great. We actually just hired one of his guys, which is why I brought it up. But like he gets the importance of that from a branding perspective. That's what that's what esports is. That's what gaming is. So it's a total one to one fit, uh, I would say, for a, the, you know, 15 to 25 year old now what happens when when you bring together a a, a professional athlete and, and an esports athlete you know you know what, what what's that what's it like just like just two kids just having a ball together or like what, 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 
Yeah, the irony is, uh, I don't know if you want to see, hear this, but the eSport athlete usually doesn't know who the professional athlete is. <laughs> it's like, I say, hey, you know, unless it's, you know, KD or LeBron or whatever, they know Bronny, LeBron's son, he plays all the time, right? He's awesome. Um, but they, if, you know, if it's some um, guy in the NFL, they're like, I, I, I don't know who that is. You know? <laughs> but like, if they want to play, maybe, you know. But the guy in the NFL knows your guys. Yes. Yes. They and do. that's what's so special. Guys. Yeah. It's the reverse, right? Like, you and I grew up you know, idolizing these guys here, right? They, they, I'm not saying they grew up idolizing Benji Fishy in Fortnite, but they, if they play Fortnite, you know who Benji Fishy is, and you're like, that kid is freaking cracked. Like, I don't know how he does what he does. Just like when I go to play golf and I suck, and then I come back and watch golf on TV, I'm like, how do they get the ball to stop and spin back and do that stuff? It's no different, right? It's no different. It's just a different generation, different passions. If you don't grow up playing Little League Baseball, you probably aren't going to be a baseball fan unless one of your parents pulled you into it, right? Or a neighbor. So all these kids are growing up playing games and they're going to grow up. What, why I think what you're doing is so was so special and smart is like, they're, what are they going to do? They're going to invest, participate and bet on the things that they do and that they like. They're not going to bet on baseball because they don't know baseball. They don't watch baseball. They're going to bet on Call of Duty because they know that Scump and Formal are cracked and that these guys can probably beat, uh, you know, the Gorillas next week. And that's what Vegas is going to be like. So you go into, uh, what is it, uh, which one of the hotels there is like all gaming that the whole platform is esports and um, ah. The Grand, I think that's what it's called. And, uh, you know, you sit down and there's a big yeah, yeah. cubicle there and you light, you, you get your table service and bottles and instead of music and girls, you get your controller and you're playing games and watching stuff and you can bet on it. And that's not the future, that's the present, trust me. The betting space in esports is going to be enormous. Yeah, it's one of the things, It's it's you know, it, I get, I get asked that question all the time. And the problem is, is the people are asking the question, the people that are, who, who work at a lot of the books today are not gamers. They're yeah. not true gamers. So they don't really understand where it's all going. And so I always tell young people, you know, if you're interested in betting and you, maybe you're not going to be a professional gamer, there's an opportunity for you to go work for some of the biggest sports betting operation, operators out there. Because in the future, as you said, these young people are going to want to bet on those games over the traditional sports games. Yeah, the whole thesis is well. One, you're right. There's incredible inefficiencies in the lines right now. I can tell you, <laughs> I can tell you that. To um, the thesis, like behind the Call of Duty League, is uh, it was a great example. Brett, um, who you may have been our president, Brett Lautenbach, who's amazing. He's he's uh, 30, I think, around there. Uh, grew up playing Call of Duty with his with his bros in high school uh, in Naperville. They all went to college around the country, but they all kept in touch by doing what? Playing Call of Duty, you know, after work at night. And what do they do for their bro weekends? They go to Call of Duty events because they get together and like, oh, New York City down in, you know, in Brooklyn is, at, you know, at the Barclays Center is a Call of Duty championship. Let's go. And they go to New York. And then and they'll, they'll probably bet on it. Just, you know, it's not much different than like, oh, there's March Madness event in the, you know, southern region in whatever, in Georgia. That's what this generation is going to do. And it's happening right now. Well, we completely agree with you. And as we start to wrap up our 76 Capital Leadership Series here with Andy Miller, the chairman, CEO, and co-owner of Energy Sports, Esports, um, you know, Andy. I guess I want to. Last thing I just want to ask you really is just so far in your career, you've done so many things on the entrepreneurial side, in the tech side of the world, and now in the sports world. Do you have one moment or what one thing that is your proudest moment so far uh, in your career? Proudest moment. Hmm. Well, I could say selling the company to Apple probably was the biggest culmination. And it wasn't the actual selling. It was my my one on one death match with Steve about selling the company. And uh, it's a really long story. It's a great story. But it went on for a guy who was fading, you know, he had more energy than I'll ever have. And he took us around and around for many hours, you know, to get to a deal. And um, 
I didn't wilt, you know, I didn't have, uh, uh, I was fortunate because my co-founder Ishwar was a Steve fanboy being an engineer and loved him and every word, you know, and Steve was tough. In fact, he was just like, at one point he looked at me and he put his hand up in front of Ishwar's face and he said, I'm not talking to him anymore. Okay. I'm talking to you. You don't speak until I need you to say something. And Ishwar was like, okay. And so, okay, it's up to me now to, you know, to sell this thing. And um, we did. And and it felt great to, you know, work all, all that hard over a bunch of different companies and get to the point where, you know, somebody at that level and Apple at, at the height of uh, the height of the heights of Apple's fame, uh, you know, picked us. It was really rewarding. Well, Andy, it's been awesome. It's been amazing having you uh, as a guest on our show. And, you Thank know, you got to make sure that everybody you know, you go out there, follow Andy at A Miller on Twitter. Um, follow, of course, NRG Esports across all platforms, um, and and see all the amazing things that are going on in the esports industry, and certainly what NRG is doing as as a team, as one of the best teams in the world. So remember, if you're an entrepreneur, an athlete, a student, a business person who wants to work or start a company in the whether it's in the sports betting industry the esports industry like andy has been able been able to do now sports tech sports media industry please reach out to us at 76 capital we'd love to connect with you so once again again andy thank you so much for joining our show thank you it was fun i enjoyed it not to see you in person <laughs> I, I got i got can't wait to see you soon again i'm willing to this edition of our 76 capital leadership series